Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to talk about how do you know which statistic to use in different research situations? This is a really important and difficult skill. Right? When you're taking a statistics course, you can tell based on the chapter which statistic you should use. Right? If you're in the single sample T chapter, you know that you should be doing a single sample T. But once you leave the class, that's actually not how it's going to work. You'll collect data or plan a study and you have to know ahead of time um, how you're going to actually go ahead and analyze that data without knowing which chapter um, in the book is appropriate. You also need to know, even know which statistic is appropriate for a set of data in order to look in the right, look, look in the stats book and determine which chapter is the right one to go to. It's an important skill and a difficult skill I know that takes quite a bit of practice. So here I'm trying to give you an overview of the statistics that we're going to work with in this class. So this flow chart here shows you the different statistics, they're highlighted in blue here, um, that we're going to make some decisions about and work with in this video. This is not an exhaustive list of all statistics ever, it's just what we're covering in this introductory class. Okay, so let's start at the very top of the flow chart. The first question asks, are you comparing sample means? So this is our starting point. So the first thing to notice here is that when you're reading a research scenario, you have to determine if the data are measured on an interval ratio scale, because that's the only kind of measurement you can use for computing a mean. Okay. So your very first step is figuring out whether or not you have interval ratio data where it would actually make sense to compare means. Now the question will be, how many means are you going to work with? Right? Are you gonna compare one sample mean to another value of interest, or are you going to be comparing a sample mean to a different sample means? Now, there are other options in the flowchart that don't involve sample means at all. Uh, we're going to come back to those later. So when you read a problem, you're going to have to decide how many sample means you have. And it could be categorized as one sample mean, two sample means, or three or more all get clumped together here. So those are our three categories. Now the thing is, when you read a problem, it might not actually tell you the value for the sample mean or means, but it will let you know how many sample or groups are in the study. And if you know how many samples or groups, you know how many you could ultimately compute. Okay, so don't necessarily look for numbers, but you're looking for how the study is designed. Okay. So if you have one sample mean, um, what you have to determine is whether or not you know the population standard deviation. Right? If you look over here at the flowchart, you can see if you follow down from one sample mean, the next question you're asked is, well, do you know the population standard deviation? That's a little sigma there. Now, if you do know the population standard deviation, you can use the Z for a sample mean. If you do not know the population standard deviation, you need to use the single sample T. Okay. So, noting that you might not be given the standard deviation of the sample in a problem, but you can always compute it from your data. But for the population standard deviation, that has to be present in the problem. You can't compute that yourself. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples here. This first one, uh, we know that the average score on the ACT in the population is 20.8 with a standard deviation of 5.8. Right, so you start there and we know that we're talking about a population and we have a population mean and we have a population standard deviation. Right? The next part says a teacher selects a random sample of 90 students from their school and each student completes the ACT. The average for the sample is 22.1 with a standard deviation of 5.5. So here we have sample data. We have the sample mean of 22.1 and the sample standard deviation of 5.5. And we want to know what um, statistic you would use to compare those values. What statistic would you use to compare the 22.1 to the 20.8? Okay. So this is an example of a Z for a sample mean because we have the population standard deviation there. Now I realize you also have the sample standard deviation, but given the choice between using a population standard deviation and a sample standard deviation, it's better to use the population standard deviation. Okay. All right, our next example is a student wonders if people can accurately judge the passage of time. And so to test this, she recruits a sample of 50 people and asks them to sit in a dark, quiet room for 20 minutes. At the end of the 20 minutes, she asks people to report how long they thought they were in the room. 
the average estimate was 29 minutes with a standard deviation of 4.9. Right. So our average estimate there for the sample of um, 50 people was 29 minutes with a standard deviation of 4.9. So we have a sample mean and we're comparing that one sample mean to a known value of theoretical interest. That's the 20 minutes. Right. So since we're comparing a sample mean to one value, so we have one sample mean that we're comparing to a value and we only have a sample standard deviation, we're going to use the single sample t. All right, so now we're going to move down the flow chart here to examples where you have two sample means. So if you have two sample means, you can see in the flow chart there that there are two options. There's going to be an independent t option or a related t option. And this totally depends on the design of the study. So if the samples are um, related to each other, um, it's going to be using a related samples t. So this would be an example of a repeated design where you measure the same people twice. Or, for example, you have a match study where you match people on some important pre-existing variable um, before they uh, participate in the study. Then you would use the related t. For the independent measures t, you have two entirely separate groups. So you have two different groups of people. Right. So with the repeated T, basically you're measuring the same people twice. Uh, for the independent T, you have two separate groups of people. Okay, so let's look at a couple of examples of this. So here we have our first one with an English teacher wants to know if program A is more effective than program B at improving reading comprehension. So to test this, he obtains a sample of 100 students and randomly assigns 50 to program A and 50 to program B. So we want to know what statistic you, you would use to compare the mean scores for the two programs. Right? So we have two means we could obtain, and I realize the means are not in the problem because we haven't done the study yet, right? but they're going to get the data. And so you can tell that with those two separate means or two separate groups, we could get means because we're going to assume that reading comprehension scores are uh, measured on an interval ratio scale. Okay? So in that case, you would use an independent T because it's two separate groups. Moving on to the next example, a statistic instructor wonders what impact her class has on students' math anxiety. So to assess this, she asks 60 students to complete a math anxiety test on the first day of class and then again on the last day of class. So if we're comparing the mean to, on day one to the mean on the last day of class and we're measuring the same people twice, right? that's a repeated measures design. It's a related samples T because we have two means, and, but they both came from the same people. Okay, now we're going to look at examples where we have three or more sample means. And so this, you have a different decision to make. Once you've identified if you have three or more means, we want to know how many independent variables or grouping variables there are in the study. And that'll determine whether or not you're going to use a one-way ANOVA or a two-way ANOVA. So you use a one-way ANOVA if you have one independent variable in the study. Use a two-way ANOVA if you have two independent variables in the study. Let's look at a couple of examples here. The first one we have is a health psychologist wants to know if stress levels differ between freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. And to investigate this, she obtains a sample of 200 students with 50 in each category. And then all students complete a stress inventory that measures stress levels on an interval ratio scale. So we wanna know what statistic we would use to compare stress levels between these four groups. So we have four groups. And now the question is how many independent variables we have. And we only have one. We have year in school, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and that has four levels. Right? So that would be an example of a one-way ANOVA because we only have one variable with four levels. Now we can contrast that to this example below where the health psychologist wants to know if stress levels differ between freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and if this depends on whether they live on campus or commute. So here we have two separate independent variables. We have year in school with four levels, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, and we also have where students live. Do they live on campus or commute? Right. So because we have two separate variables there, we're going to do a two-way ANOVA or a two-factor ANOVA. Okay, we're moving down the flow chart now to uh, different studies where you're not comparing means. So you answer no to that original question about comparing means, and then it takes you down to this bottom part of the flow chart. 
So not all research questions are about mean comparisons. A lot of them are, <laughs> but not all are. Um, some are measuring association or frequency accounts. So the next question you ask is about whether um, you're looking at frequency counts or not. So if you're not looking at means, are the data frequency accounts, just counting up the people in categories or not? So we're starting with the um, no category here. So looking at the flowchart here, we're in this section circled in red here about are the data frequency counts, right? We already determined that we're not comparing sample means, so we followed that down to the question about are the data frequency accounts. If your answer is no, there are three different statistics that are possible in these situations. It's going the Pearson's R, the Spearman R, or a regression. All right, so let's talk about each of these in a little more detail. So you're going to use Pearson's R when the data are interval ratio, and then you also need to show, look at a scatter plot and determine whether or not the relationship between the two variables is linear. Okay. So the purpose of using a Pearson's R is you want to see if two variables are related to each other, and you're going to describe the direction of the relationship between the variables as well as the size or strength of the relationship between those variables. You're also going to compute a p-value and try to determine if that difference is likely to be due to sampling error. Okay. Regression is also used when data are interval ratio and the scatter plot is linear, but your purpose there for regression is to create an equation that allows you to predict scores on one variable from another variable. Finally, Spearman's R is used when the data are ordinal or if your data are interval ratio, but they're not linear. They do need to be monotonic, but they do not need to be linear. Okay, so let's look at examples of each of these. In our first example, we have a college admission officer who is considering eliminating standardized tests for admissions to their university. Before doing this, she wants to know if SAT scores predict GPA during the freshman year. So what statistic would you use to determine if SAT scores are associated with GPA? So this is going to be a um, interval ratio data, right? SAT scores are interval ratio, as is GPA. So they're both interval ratio, and in that case, we're going to use a Pearson R. Right? I know that in these problems, we can't tell you about this, the shape of the graph or anything, um, but that's something you look at once you actually see your data. So we have interval ratio data where our purpose here is to determine if these two variables are related to each other. We want to describe the strength and the direction of that relationship. We want to know how good of a predictor it is. Okay. The next question, we have a college admission officer who wants to develop an equation that would allow them to predict college GPA from high school GPA. Now here's where you use regression. Right. So in the, for correlation, you're just seeing if there's a relationship and how strong the relationship is. With regression, you're using that relationship then to write an equation that allows you to predict somebody's um, score on one variable from another variable. Right? Finally, our last one, a college admission officer wants to know if class rank predicts college GPA. Right, so college GPA is interval ratio, but class ranking, right, first, second, third, fourth, and so forth, is ordinal. Because one of the variables is ordinal, you need to use a Spearman correlation. All right, so now if we look at frequency counts, this is our last category on the flowchart. So here we've said we're not comparing sample means and the data are frequency counts. So in this case, when you have frequency counts where you're just counting up the number of people in categories, you have two choices. One is the chi-square test of goodness of fit, and you use that when you have one variable the test of independence is what you use when you have two variables. Okay, let's look at a couple of examples here. The first one, a pollster in the United States conducts a study of the general population and finds that 60% of people think college tuition should be free, while 40% think it should not be free. A different researcher plans to ask the same question of people in the um, EU. And we wanna know which statistic would you use to determine if opinions are different in the EU than in the US. So here we have frequency counts. It's just yes or no, whether or not people um, think that college tuition should be free. Okay? And then we also um, are gonna compare their answers to a predetermined um, set of expectations based on what happened in the United States. 
Right? So we have just one variable here, and that is um, whether or not people think that their the tuition should be free. Right? Whereas down below in the next example, we have political party affiliation and age. We're wondering if the two together are related to opinions on free tuition. So to investigate this, the researcher recruits Republicans and Democrats to participate in a study and also recruits participants based on their age, young, 20 to 25, or 50 to 60, or 55 to 60, and then ask them if they think college tuition is free. So here we have two different variables. We're measuring the association between Republicans and Democrats and their opinions on free tuition based on their age. Right, so we have Republican Democrat with two levels and age with two levels. Right? And these will, um, both of these are chi-square problems. The first one has just one variable, so it would be chi-square um, test for goodness of fit. We're testing to see how well that EU data matches up with the US data. And then the second example is a chi-square test of independence because we want to know if political party is independent of age in people's um, opinions on free tuition. All right, so we covered a lot of statistics kind of quickly in this video, but you should know there are a lot of statistics that we're not covering in this introductory course. And you should also know that sometimes you can use different statistics to analyze the same set of data. Like technically you can use an ANOVA to analyze data when you have just two groups. You could use it for two groups or three or more groups. But we wanna focus on um, right now just making clear distinctions about when to use different tests and leaving these um, discussions for like how different ways you can analyze the same set of data for more advanced classes. Yeah, I hope that helps you learn to distinguish between the different statistics and when to use them. And now you can go ahead and practice um, using the activities in the book there. All right, good luck.